Are you guys are you guys ready? Are you excited? This I've put some time and effort into this. Um and there there is actual information in this PowerPoint, okay? As with any opening, you have to actually play it yourself to get a feel for how it works. You know, this isn't gonna be definitive. Yeah, guys, I've put on my I've put on a serious outfit for you. I've got a serious outfit um and serious glasses and i'm ready for my serious presentation one one thing i do want to say is b4 is not just like it it's not just played for tricks okay um so b4 you can play i believe can be played in any time control okay it has been played in classical um and not just by me so yeah i call it the polish you can also call it the sokolski which is what colonel likes to call it you can also call it the orangutan I don't know anyone who plays B4 who calls it the orangutan, so... Okay, who am I and why should you listen? I have a 100% win or draw rate with the Polish in my classical practice games. The one game against Guy where I tilt resign doesn't count as a loss because it was drawn position, okay? Um, so, not being winning out of the opening literally doesn't matter unless you're a GM, okay? So like, going out of the opening in like an equal position is completely fine. Okay, you don't need to be one out of the opening to play like classical practice games. So like my my classical games that I've been using as practice for OTB. I have won more than half of all my games on chess.com across all time controls where I've opened with B4, okay? So I've played 1,555 games on chess.com using this opening of which I have won almost 800 and lost around 700, okay? Um, so it's pretty much, I'm, it's, it's more that I'm winning, okay, than I'm losing, which is pretty poggies because I, I lose most of my games. Um, <clears throat> so here are also some testimonials from Johnny and Druid basically saying that B4 is great, okay? Um, and I also have this um, little reminder that at the Meltwater Crypto Cup, uh, Magnus played B4. Um, and here's a little meme for you guys. He played it a couple of times, actually. I think he played it twice. And he did draw twice, because, um, yeah. Now that we've um, established that you should be listening to me, um, I'm about to, I'm about to uh, address what I get asked all the time, okay? Um, and what I get asked all the time is, but Lula, why not just play 1e4? I'm glad you asked, random stock photo man. Why not just play 1e4? Hmm? Why not? Well, I have a pros and cons list for you. Okay, so let's look at 1b4 versus 1e4 before we start. So, 1b4 is played by some of the world's best chess memers, Magnus Carlsen and Lula Robs. 1e4 is played by... <clears throat> <clears throat> Nigel Short and not Lula. Okay, so that's already a good reason to not play e4 and to play b4 instead. b4 also confuses opponents from move number one and there is statistically a 50% chance that they will start panicking and vomiting. Okay, um, whereas e4, it doesn't confuse them. They see it all the time. All, all the time. They're seeing e4 all the time. Yeah, exactly. So b4 will never ever go behind your back and transpose. Never. It will never transpose on you. Whereas E4, it transposes into literally anything your opponent wants, okay? Thank you for the follow. It will It will literally transpose, like, into anything they want. They, you, they get to choose the opening. If you play E4, you don't actually get to choose the opening, okay? So B4 aims to control the center slightly later, like a civilized intellectual, whereas E4 aims to control the center from move one. Toxic masculinity it just stems from insecurity. The fact that you need to outright try to control the center from move one. It doesn't have BDE, okay, guys? So B4, if you play B4, it just immediately makes you sexy, okay? I don't make the rules. It's just a fact. Whereas E4, it, there's no edge to it, you know? It's it's very mainstream and it's just very not, cre it's not very creative, okay? Um, now there are, you know, some pros to E4 and some cons to B4. So the, the con to, e, to B4 is that there is no E in the notation. And E being, you know, the most commonly used letter in the English language, I can understand why you might want there to be an E in the notation. But E4 is actually like, yes, it is a legal move and I guess it's playable. So it does have those two things going for it. Um, so yeah, 
those those are like the immediate reasons why I would recommend playing B4 over E4. Um, and now we will get into oh, I've got one more, I've got one more preemptive for you. Um, so don't worry, don't worry. We have, but Lula, I'm a misogynist and I want to play the Polish. Okay, don't worry guys, you can do both. So lovable rascal Bobby Fischer also played one before. He did. Um, it says here that he played it in a simul that one time, but I have actually since found out that he's played it three, he played it three times in three different simuls. So yeah, he did win with it. And then here's just a nice little, um, nice little uh, quote from Bobby Fischer. Sorry, I've got one more preemptive question. So what about 1b3, okay? A lot of people, they do actually like to move the b pawn these days, but they prefer to play 1b3, which was popularized by um, a chassable course, a lifetime repertoire's chassable course made by GM Adiban Baskaran, and that's fine. You can play 1b3 if you want to, but I don't think you should. Just, just a recommendation. I may not be a GM, but I actually do have this picture here, which I have um, photoshopped where there's a thought bubble. Exactly, Virgin B3 versus Chad B4, exactly. So after watching Nuda's presentation, I wish I'd made a chassable course on 1B4 instead. <gasps> so yeah, um, I also have a, a, a little bit um, more on this, just in case you're already not sold on B4 versus B3. So my personal opinion is that 1b3 is a misguided attempt at playing on the flank without fully committing to the spirit of opening with the b-pawn. Okay, and these are photos of real men. They are actually real men. Um, you can't dispute that. And this is them finding out that b3 is a scam. Now you can dispute that part, but you can't dispute the fact that these are photos of men, you know? So if you think that this might be you, this could be you instead. If you stop playing b3, and start playing B4. Um, results are not guaranteed. <clears throat> not at all, no. I have mouse sipped B3 before. It left, a, it left a sour taste in my mouth, okay? So, chapter number one, opening traps. Now, as some of you know, I recently, recently participated in an online rapid tournament. And um, shout out to Alessia. She commentated the tournament, she did say, that she felt that B, B4 isn't very good if they don't hang the rook. Now, I disagree, okay? There are a lot of opening traps. There are two main opening traps that we're gonna cover. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, okay. So there are two opening traps and we're gonna look at them both, which will be good for you guys playing against me and for you guys playing this as white. And because I'm moving away from the Polish um, as my main weapon against you guys, because you guys that you know, I'm gonna show you guys all the, all, the, all the traps. So obviously the main trap, okay, like the, the biggest L is the tasty H8 rook, okay guys? That rook on H8 do be looking kinda tasty though. Let's be honest. And, I just have to say that I have seen people 2000 elo and above hang this rook, okay? When playing the Polish, you should always leave your b-pawn hanging, okay? You don't need to protect your b-pawn until the h8 rook is covered, okay? So yeah, leave your b-pawn hanging until your dark squared bishop's path to the h8 rook is obstructed or the rook is protected, okay? So if black's dark squared bishop leaves the defense of the trapped h8 rook too soon, then you will win the rook, okay? Moving on, um, I'm just gonna show you guys also, don't hang your b-pawn, okay? So I'm saying don't protect your b-pawn, but you will need to at some point do something about your b-pawn, okay? So a lot of people do actually play f6 to reinforce their e-pawn. This is by far not the best response, but it does reinforce the e-pawn and I have seen it many times and people do play it. It is actually very difficult for um, white to exploit the light square diagonal to black's king in the Polish. It's not as devastating in this opening as it can be in others. Um, so when they do something like this, what you need to do is not hang your pawn. So you've got two main options. Um, you've got a3 and you've got b5. Siding between a3 and b5. So you've got a question to ask yourself. Would it be annoying for your opponent to not be able to put their knight on c6? Um, if yes, then you might wanna play b5. Uh, or you can just play a3. 
or you can play b5 anyway it depends you know how jazzy you're feeling i actually think that both are fine a3 is technically best if you engine check it but it can be very frustrating yeah for black to not be able to develop their horsey to c6 and if they do develop their horsey to c6 that's something that we're going to look at very soon uh this is just a little bit of you know try not to try not to mess up um this is this is a guide for you guys not for your opponents so how to not hang the rook if black decides to trade their e5 pawn for white's b4 pawn if black decides to trade then they should immediately follow up with knight f6 so as not to hang the rook on h8 so knight f6 is preferable to other moves such as f6 bishop f8 and queen g5 okay yeah people are just bitter because they hang their rooks okay guys knight f6 is by far the best move here uh for black if they play anything else it's just not as good okay so don't do it thank you for the follow trading the e5 pawn for the b4 pawn is a great option for black i do have to say it's a great option for black um there are other lines of course we're gonna look at some of them but if um if black does trade they do have two pieces out but they have traded off one of their central pawns okay and there are some critical lines in which both of black's central pawns get traded off and white will have an, a really nice center okay the bishop is a little bit misplaced but so is the bishop on b4 to be honest it can be kicked around so we're gonna look at the other opening the other opening trap slash opening mistake which happens a lot okay if you engine check it, it doesn't really matter that white's got um a central pawn for the flank pawn it does depend what you do with your central pawns after that point so the second um mistake is knight c6 okay um and knight c6 is a big mistake and i know all of the people in chat who are like i'm 2400 online i would never play knight c6 okay be quiet lots of people do play knight c6 okay like 98 percent of all chess players are like below 1500 online so be quiet lots of people are going to play knight c6 all right so if your opponent has played knight c6 you can probably get something out of this okay unless they played a6 or some move that neutralizes b5 okay see exactly i've seen people who are 2000 play knight c6 i've seen them i've seen them look at it and i've seen them say oh yeah knight c6 it defends my pawn it attacks their pawn no you don't play knight c6 don't do it okay so b5 horsing around horsing around okay where does the horsey go we're gonna look at all of the options the horsey can go to several different places okay some of them are trash most of them are trash you're winning at this point already okay guys so after b5 you are at the very least winning the e5 pawn for free you are going to be up a pawn out of the opening you are going to be happy you are going to be living the dream who plays knight c6 it is my opponent's most common response okay my opponents play knight c6 all the time all the time this is the worst move that black can play um apart from just leaving the horse where it is which also sucks um this this happens okay i'm gonna be honest with you guys your opponents are probably not gonna do this if they're over 1300 elo make a square if you're under 1300 they may trap their own knight okay um and after yeah after b4 e5 bishop b2 knight c6 b5 knight b4 there is nothing they can do the horse is dead okay the horse is going to the glue factory so you will play c4 trapping the knight removing the d5 square from the knight okay guys removing the d5 square is key otherwise you're not trapping the horse all right any move after that point there there is no move okay you're just winning the knight so a3 and the horsey has gone to the glue factory and you're just going to be up a piece okay you're going to be up a piece on like move six you cannot ask me for more up a piece on move six okay this is fine this is fine it's not scuffed no scuffed stream no scuffed stream there we go okay so horsey going back right if after b5 your opponent plays knight b8 you're winning the e5 pawn as usual and um you are the only one with any development whatsoever it doesn't really matter that they can play d6 and kick your bishop back it doesn't really matter you're still winning yeah 
You're still you're still winning. Yeah. So if the horse goes back to the starting square, you you collect your e5 pawn and your bishop goes back to his little house on b2, you're up a pawn, you're very happy, your opponent is somewhat traumatized. And like there's a really good chance that in these openings, your opponent's gonna start doing something very strange, okay? When these things happen to people in openings that they don't recognize, they, like all of their chess principles for whatever reason just go out, out of the window. They start playing really weird things. They start playing like, literally any move that tries to get rid of your b pawn people get obsessed over getting rid of the b pawn they are just traumatized by its by its existence on b5 i don't understand why they're just clearly upset so now this is an extremely common response to to b5 okay um so they may put their horsey down down in your in your stable, okay? They might put their horsey on d4. Now, you don't take the horsey, okay? You don't take it. You don't take the horsey. You kick the horsey. You will just continue to kick the horsey. He's horsing around. You will play e3, which is a thematic move in the Polish. You will play e3 anyway at some point. So this just allows you to develop with tempo, okay? You're developing with tempo. He moves the horsey. Um, and after they move their horsey, you will again collect the e5 pawn, okay? They can put their knight down on e7. Thank you for the follow. If, if your opponent is putting their knight on e7, please don't lose the game. Please, please, please don't lose the game, guys. Come on. Come on, knight c e7. How are they getting their bishop out? What are they doing? You're just up a pawn. You're living the dream. You are, you're doing everything that you wanted and they're doing nothing that they wanted, okay? You're up a pawn and their horse looks dumb, okay? Now, they can also put their horsey on a5, okay? And this actually is, this is okay, but who wants their horsey on a5? Do you want a horsey on a5? I don't. I don't want a horsey on a5. Wait, why is my why is it scuffed again? Oh well. There is a there we go. Oh, there's a there's a little horsey for you. Okay. This is only slightly scuffed. Um no one wants a knight on the edge of the board. You don't want it. Uh, I don't really know why people do this. Sometimes if you'll play b5 later on in the opening, they'll put their knight here and it's not as bad but it's just not comfy, you know? You are again, just very happy. Um, so those are pretty much the opening, those are pretty much the opening traps. And now this is by no means the end of the presentation. There is a lot more to cover. So yeah, if you, if you lose the game after they open like this, then, oh man, there's not much help for you, is there? Um, no. It's fine. I've lost the game. I have lost the game after hang after winning the rook. So it's never too late. It's never too late to lose the game, guys. So if your opponent survives the opening, you're playing you're playing the Polish, so you have great queenside control, and you're gonna get some huge dubs anyway. Alright? This at this point we're moving on to chapter two. Okay? Chapter two is thematic ideas. So it's time to start asking yourself some questions. And you should probably be doing this in most games and most openings and most positions where you say, like, where do my pieces belong? And where am I going to castle? You know, how many more moves until my opponent resigns? What shall I eat for lunch tomorrow? And how much longer is this presentation going to go on for? Who knows? This is why you have to start asking yourself these questions. Fighting for the center. Right. So if we're going to look at the main line, which doesn't really exist, but sure, we'll talk about the main line. There are two main there are two main pawn pushes after black decides to trade their central pawn for white's flank pawn, okay? There's C3, which has been played by, you know, the world champion, whoever that is, I don't know, never heard of him, sounds fake. And there's also E3, which I play, and they're both fine, they're both they're both valid. Um I actually have a book which tries to argue that the main line here is C4, but C4 here is also fine. I mean, I've played it, it's fine too. 
You can even just play knight f3 here. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of moves here which don't lose the game. Who is Magnus calling? Very good question. Who? Who is Magnus calling? I don't know. Um, so you, we're going to look at both of these two main moves, okay? So we're going to look at c3. Now, the idea behind c3 uh, is to often play a quick d4 and for white to trade off the dark squared bishop in exchange for black's knight on f6. This is a very reasonable way to play this opening, okay? You are, you are just not you're not worse just because they know the theory, okay? You're not worse just because they haven't hung anything. You're still fine. You're still equal out of the opening, okay? Okay? This is fine. You can play you can play like this. Magnus has done this, like this is engine checked, this is fine. Um so you can play C3 D4 e3 and get like a triangle set up is very solid it's fine you'll maybe later play c4 and expand like that um and black should fight for the center okay critical moves are moves like c5 and d5 d5 is quite a big move for black in the polish okay if they play one of the more critical lines they really do need to fight back for the center should you exchange your bishop on e5 for the knight if you play it this way i would probably recommend it However, you can also put the bishop on g3 and putting the bishop on g3 isn't going to lose you the game. Like, it's fine. Um, so this is one way to play it. This this is fine. Um, you can also play e3. e3 is also fine. Okay. Um, the bishop pair is a myth. Okay. e3 is a little bit more flexible. e3 is what I play. e3 is what I play just because that's what I learned to play when I um, learned this opening. And e3 allows you to tuck your bishop back in after, basically. So this is a supposed continuation. This is all engine check. Thank you for the follow. So you can uh, play e3, black might castle. Uh, you can play c4. Black can play d5. Uh, you can capture, they can capture. You can put your bishop back. They can bring their bishop out to f5. It's a move that I see quite often. Um, and knight f3, knight d7, yes, you haven't castled, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that black has castled before you because you will castle soon enough. You will develop your light squared bishop and castle. And at some point you'll probably decide what you wanna do with your b knight, decide what you wanna do with your dark squared bishop, decide if you wanna play d4, which you probably do. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this now. So where do your pieces belong? So white will pretty much always castle kingside. You have moved your flank pawns, okay, on the queen side. So you don't really want to castle into that. You don't want to castle long unless you, I don't know, something really, really bad happens and you can't castle short. Um, can I play a game with b4 after the presentation for the viewers? If you're going to castle, you're going to castle kingside, pretty much. I don't think I've ever castled long in a Polish because what are you castling into? Nothing. There's, there's nowhere safe to castle on the queen side, okay? So, um, white will also develop their g knight to f3. The b knight can go to either c3 or d2. And you see in this position on the board that d4 has been played and that you can here play uh, knight d2. It means if... Um, sometimes black does pin the f3 knight with bishop g4. That's fine too. You can develop your knight and then you can unpin the queen. Um... Yes, exactly. The best part of playing b4 is when your opponent gets, you know, like I said earlier, they will get confused. You know, there's a 50% chance that they will start panicking and vomiting. 50%. That's an extremely high chance. Okay. <laughs> d4 is thematic. You might want to play d4. Um, I have played games where I've played d3 and e4 and things like that. Y you will be the best judge of the position at any given time your opponent might play weird things. You might not want to play d4. Um, I played a whole classical game against Sky where I didn't play d4 until the, the end game. So um, if you do play d4, you are going to want to do something about your dark squared bishop. You can either trade it off you can put it on a3. You can uh, rotate it around the board. There's a you problem. It's not a me problem. Um, in this position, so this is after 4e3. Um, both of the sides have equal chances. So you'll see that black has done pretty much everything they should do. They did play d5, which is very critical. They developed, they castled, um, they've activated all of their pieces. Both sides have followed opening principles. 
white is developed and castled as well. And you will see here that black has connected their rooks. So black is, uh, I guess you could say slightly more developed, but if you do look, white is the only player here with a center, okay? The, the thing about trading off that e pawn for the flank pawn here was that white is gonna be the only one with a center. So it doesn't really matter that black's got rooks on d on on d8 and e8 because you have uh central pawns and also the open lines on the queen side can be used to white's advantage so you want to always play on the side of the board that you, where you're strongest and in a lot of times in the polish you will have great queen side control sometimes you won't and then you've probably done something wrong anyway um, so if you can trade off black's light squared bishop, which is a little bit annoying there on f5, but it's not impossible to trade off, then you can put your rooks on b1 and c1. You've got two semi-open files and you will have great control of the queen side. Okay. Um, so moving on. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the middle game. In positions where black decides not to trade their central pawn for the flank pawn, um, you might, um, you might end up pushing a lot more of your queenside pawns and gaining space that way. So e5 and d6 is viable and it is the line and black can play it and it's fine. Um, I've played it. I played it against Guy in a classical game and I won. It's There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not as critical of a line. It just doesn't fight for as much of the center as the critical line. There's nothing wrong with it though, okay? so. In this position, white's probably going to play b5 quite soon. You know, you, white hasn't castled, but I like white's position. I don't know about you guys, but I do. Um, in this position, after b4, e5, bishop b2, d6, reinforcing the e5 pawn. Uh, c4, knight f6, okay? c4 is very thematic. You are going to want to play c4. Um, both sides have just developed very normal nothing crazy um and this game is going to be pretty positional okay um sometimes i have some pranksters coming into my chat saying luda it's so weird that you're a positional chess player when the polish is such a tactical opening shut up just be quiet okay this is this is a completely normal game of chess okay this this is fine there is actually nothing there's nothing here that makes anyone want to vomit okay so this isn't as critical of a line, but it's going to lead to some fine chess games, okay? We're going to do a very, very short chapter on attacking because I don't think that I can really give you guys too much advice on attacking because I suck at attacking and also um, completely depends on the position if there are tactics and so on and so forth. We'll just look a little bit at attacking now. So Lula, I'm a caveman. I don't know anything about positional chess. Blue me? Develop peace? <gasps> no sacrifice? So many people around my elo, they just want to hack attack. They just want they just wanna they just wanna come at their opponents with like everything and just kill them right right away. Um I personally believe that that's kind of tacky. But I'm gonna show you guys some attacking ideas anyway. Um, because, you know, get yourself a girl who can do both. So if you're an attacking player, then you should obviously use every, any opening you play, you should use it to your strengths. If you're an attacking player, you can greet gift in the Polish. It isn't impossible. I see a post that do it. You just don't play D4. Um, so you can also make good use of your bishop, which is fianchetted on B2. You can use the queen bishop battery. You can attack the king side. You've got great queen side control. So... If they castle queenside, which I don't really know why they would, um, because that's kind of dumb, then you can just attack them with your pawns on the queen side. Okay. If if they blunder their h8 rook, they're probably going to have to castle queenside. But sometimes people castle queenside even if they don't, which is beyond me because you've literally already started pushing your queenside pawns. But that is another way um, to attack. So I've actually got a little example for you guys from one of my blitz games where I didn't lose. Um, so attacking the king side, I decided one day I was like, I'm gonna attack today, okay, okay? So attacking the king side. One of the nice things about a slightly delayed castle for white is that black, 
very often castles immediately, okay? Um, it's one of the main moves, okay, is castling or d5. And if they castle very quickly, then you've got all of this open space on the queen side where you can start positioning your pieces to attack the king side, okay? So, um, in this game, after b4, e6, which is not great, but people do play it, um, bishop b2, knight f6, b5, so I played b5 here instead of playing a3, um, White delays the d4 push to keep lines open to the opponent's king. Now, obviously, you need line, open lines to be able to attack, guys. So there is actually um, a tactic here. After I played uh, knight g5, they have to play h6, okay? You know, an h6, relatively intuitive. You know, they have to play h6. But they didn't play h6, okay? Black just missed the threat. They didn't play h6. They decided, you know, I'm going to take that pawn. That looks like a free, free b pawn. Free B pawn for me, okay? But that's a blunder. Okay, guys, what's the move here to win on the spot? Knight takes D5. Yay, knight takes D5. After knight takes D5, um, white is offering black an entire piece, but you can't capture, obviously, because you'll get checkmated. Um, and you also can't allow bishop takes F6, because that also removes the defender of H7. But there isn't actually really anything that uh, black can do, is there? So black is forced to play knight e4. And that gives an entire piece up for free. After knight takes e4, you can't capture with the queen or it's just a trade. The mate threat is neutralized, but black is lost. Black is just down a, down a whole piece, okay? This game is not worth playing. You haven't even castled. You know, we're like 10 moves in and you've already won the game. Okay, guys, so it is 100% possible to attack the opponent's king side in blitz games in the Polish. You don't need to have any fancy tricks. Um, and yeah, you don't actually have to play it. Um, you don't have to play it this way either. You don't have to rely on them not playing h6. Even if h6, you might want to play h4 and, and dare them to take your knight with your uh, rook on the open h file, you know? So there there are lots of ways to attack okay helps when they play moves like b6 like i said people play crazy things as soon as you have a b pawn on like b5 or whatever people start to do things that they would like never do in normal openings they just get very very upset by the presence of your queen side pawns what i'm trying to say here is that you don't have to win in three moves you don't have to win the rook to win a game okay i won all of my games in the dragon masters and i didn't win a single rook or pawn out of the opening with my polish okay you don't have to play for tricks you just can okay um so my opponent did rage quit and then they tried to rematch me after i didn't accept uh this is just a nice tactic okay it's just one example there are lots of ways to attack everyone has a different style now we're going to look at a couple of sidelines okay guys because when i've been playing the polish in my classical games people have prepared sidelines i have not prepared against any of the sidelines and i've still won so get good guys theory isn't everything poland versus germany Sound familiar? Heike learnt the German defense, guys. Heike, I see you. I see you, Heike. We're gonna talk about it now, okay? B4, D5, bishop, B2, queen, D6, okay? There is some theory here. Black is equal after queen, D6. I know it looks weird. It's because it is weird. It's because getting the queen out this early just makes you Nelson, the chess bot, okay? So here is the theory. We're gonna talk about it and I'm gonna tell you guys, okay? So, after queen d6, you play a3. If you don't play a3, you hang the b pawn. Kind of straightforward. e5. This is the this is a theoretical line, okay? So, um, so after a3, e5, you actually play, or you can play knight f3 and allow e4. Allowing e4 is, it's interesting, okay? You know, you allow them to push their e pawn. You allow them to gain space. Um, and then you play knight d4. They will play knight f6 if they know the theory, because you're playing a theoretical line. And then you can play c4, okay? And you can allow d takes c4. Now, this is fine. Um, you fell for knight c6, b5 so much, exactly. So, 
Um, C4, do you take C4? And of course, after E3, you'll be able to recapture the pawn, okay? And now I actually really like white's position here on the second um, image. I've never played this before because I only just learned the theory. But I actually think the white has a really nice position. I'm not too worried about the d-pawn. Um, and I am kind of worried about, I mean, if black gets their b horsey to kind of like e5, you might have a couple of problems because then they have great control actually over the d3 square. Um, but you're not going to let that happen because you don't suck at positional chess, right guys? So apart from that, I really like white's position. They've got two great bishops that develop. They're going to castle very soon. Again, they've got central pawns. Um, you can challenge the e-pawn. So this is the theory um, on if your opponent plays the German defense. And if you are going to play this in longer time controls you, and you're playing against people who know you're going to play this opening, the German defense is a viable weapon against the Polish. But if you learn the theory, then actually there is nothing here for them. And I've also had a look at the engine because the theory is not um, the engine's initial choices for moves. Um, and you can just play moves which I think are slightly more intuitive. You can actually gambit the b-pawn. There are a lot of lines in b4 where you gambit the b-pawn. Um, I don't gambit anything because I'm terrified uh, of being down material, but that's a character flaw that I'm working on. And you can gambit this b-pawn, the eval still reads 0-0. Zero, zero. So after, um, after this, you do lose the b-pawn. Okay, um, c4, d takes c4, bishop takes c4, a takes b4. And if you capture again, the rooks get traded. This is very thematic in the Polish, okay? I know this this presentation is just like counting how many times I can say thematic, but if these a rooks get traded, that is something that happens all the time in the Polish, okay? Um, because in the Polish, like I said, your opponent's gonna get so upset that you have a b-pawn that's developed. I don't know why, but they get so upset and they, they're they like, I have to play a5, I'm playing a5. And if your opponent plays a5, you're never going to go b takes a5, okay guys? Don't do it. Don't go b takes a5. Don't be that person. You have a fianchetted bishop. Allow them to capture, go b takes, and then allow them to trade the rooks and capture back with your bishop. It happens a lot. It's fine. It doesn't matter. If you want to learn the theoretical line, you won't be down a pawn, but if you don't want to learn the theoretical line, then you are down a pawn here, but the eval doesn't care, okay? Exactly. So black has no development. Um, white has like four developed pieces. White is one move away from castling. Black is, you know, like three. So you're you're looking very good here. And there is actually a gambit. So you can say, oh, you want to play the German defense against me? Well, guess what? I don't care what the computer says. You can gambit. I don't know why you would, but you can play the orangutan Dima gambit. Okay, guys, if you want to gambit your material, I, I don't know why you would. This kind of sucks. But this is a line, okay? And it's theory. And um, there's theory here. So um, if somebody has the audacity to play the German defense against you, you can play E4 e4 wow um after d takes e4 either f3 or d3 are options okay i have absolutely no idea why you would go for this just just play a normal game of chess see sacking for no reason i know that there are people out here who play chess like this if you play f3 and then we have e takes f3 knight takes f3 then yes black can play e4 okay so if you follow this line with me after e4, okay, d takes e4, f3, e takes f3, knight takes f3, then after e4, the line would go something like queen e2, pinning the pawn to the king, and then probably queen e7 to unpin, and then you would have to move the knight, okay? Um, <laughs> so you can play this. You probably won't lose the game just because you play it, but... uh. After knight f3, um, yeah, after knight f3, <laughs> the I'm more Nelson than you, Gambit, exactly. Sorry, after knight takes f3, it would be uh, e4 played by black to push to attack the knight. And then you would pin the pawn with queen e2. 
Um, yeah, I don't really know why I'd play this. I'm not gonna play this. We're gonna talk about another sideline which I've faced. Okay, guys, we're gonna talk about the outflank variation. Um, and the outflank variation is uh, 1b4 c6. And I know that I always say everything's a Karakan. Yeah, that's why queen e2 is to pin the pawn. Um, I do say everything's a Karakan. This is not a Karakan, okay? It's just not. Everything's a Karakan except this. This is not a Karakan, okay? So b4 and c6, the whole point, again, is to get the queen out early. But as we already know, Getting the queen out early is very tacky. It's just lame. Stop doing it. You're not Nelson. Please, just don't do it, okay? So similarly to the German defense, you will bring the queen out on move two. So after b4, c6, bishop b2, queen b6, you again need to defend your b pawn, okay? a3, just don't hang your b pawn. Hiker and Druid and Nelson are brothers. Exactly, Hiker. Um, so... White plays c4, and this looks a little bit like a gambit, but if you're playing the theory, it's not. You're not actually gambiting the b pawn or anything. So c4. So after c4, black should play a takes b4. It is the move, okay? It is the good move. But you then have uh, c5, and I want somebody in the chat to tell me why black can't play queen takes c5. Exactly, Shadow Master. After a takes b4, black is simply losing a rook. Exactly. Now, your opponent has prepped this variation, so they're not going to fall for this. But if you are struggling to believe in the line, this is why I'm showing you, okay? I'm showing you this because otherwise it might be difficult to believe in, oh, I'm gambiting a pawn. You're not gambiting a pawn. You're not gambiting any material. It's fine. Because black just has to go back with the queen, okay? So after c5, they go queen c7, it is the main move. They should go back. White can recapture on b4. You're not down any material and black has to trade the rooks. It's the only, it's really the only viable move. Um, black's main move choices are d6 and b6, okay? Those have been played in actual games um, in the database, but e5 is an engine choice. You don't need to be afraid of these sidelines. They don't actually win any material. And um, in fact, they can fall into traps of their own making. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, the Polish defense, which is B5 for black, okay? So um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this because the first question is, um, is 1B5 playable? Hi, Spenny. So is 1B5 playable? Don't play it against E4. It just hangs a pawn, okay? Uh, against d4, now, against d4, it will throw off your average London pre-mover, okay? Now, we're playing hope chess here with b5 a little bit, guys. There are a lot of similar thematic ideas to b4, but you do have to be more careful because you are playing a tempo down. Unless you're a GM, you probably won't lose the game just because you played 1b5, but of course... 1b5 is, you know, uh, the Polish defense does kind of have some BDE though, like, let's be honest, the reckless abandon of players who are willing to spice things up is kind of endearing. Come on, guys. Uh, isn't that alone a good enough reason to play it? I'm going to talk to you guys now about what white should do, um, because white should just put both pawns in the center. If white puts both pawns in the center, they're golden. This is why I'm not, act this is I'm not advocating b5 to you guys. Okay, white should put both pawns in the center. And white scores very well if they do this. But uh, if white's gonna pre-move the London system, black scores incredibly well, I do have to say. Um, D4, B5, you're gonna score very well against your average London pre-mover, guys. Um, if, if white is playing the London, they're not gonna wanna deviate from their system. They're not gonna wanna play uh d4 e4 okay they're just they're not going to want to change uh and this does give black very good chances okay so after d4 b5 um bishop f4 bishop b7 thank you for the follow black has equalized the the eval is pretty much equal and black scores very well okay there aren't a ton of games in the database because uh because i don't think i need to answer that uh, I don't think I need to give a reason because why would you play this? Um, but yes, even if white doesn't play the accelerated London, black is fine, okay?
So after d4, b5, knight f3, bishop, uh, b, uh, bishop b7, and bishop f4, you play e6, just like the thematic e3 move in the Polish is white, and black is fine, and you have equalized. And the, the aim of the opening for black, let's remember guys, is to equalize, is to get out of the opening with an equal position. So you can actually play b5, and you won't lose just because you're playing b5. I've won games with b5, and uh, you know, if they're playing the London, you're probably gonna do pretty well. So that actually is the end of my presentation on the Polish opening. Uh, but I feel like I've given you guys a pretty comprehensive guide to the Polish. You do need to get a feel for it yourself, okay? I think that I've made a pretty good case for it, actually.